Confessions of a Disgruntled Spy by Slobodan Radoyev Mitri Chapter 10 The Confrontation with Vlado Dapchevich and the Bloody Aftermath I arrived in Brussels on December 16, 1973. I had taken Marco, the Macedonian, with me and left him in a restaurant to wait for me. The restaurant owner was a woman from our country with the name Zora. I told Marco to wait for me while I was finishing some errands downtown. He asked me why I looked so pale and if I was ill, I explained that it was probably due to a little cold. Marco knew nothing about the real reason for my trip to Brussels. At about one o'clock in the evening I telephoned Dapchevich from Zora's restaurant and told him that I had arrived in Brussels. He gave me his address, Avenue George Bergman. I took a taxi to Dapchevich's apartment. Random thoughts were entering my mind on the way over. I started wavering for a moment and asked myself all sorts of weird questions. I managed to get rid of those notions and decided that when Dapchevich appeared at his door, I would shoot him immediately. I already imagined him falling to the floor with a deadly shot from my revolver. Then again, something whispered to me asking whether it was proper to kill a feeble old man in this way. I took courage again, soothed my restless conscience and convinced myself that Dapchevich was an enemy of our country. I kept telling myself that he wanted to heap misfortune on my father, grandfathers and uncles by destroying everything they had ever fought for. He also wanted to make my brother, sister and our whole nation miserable. That gave me the strength again to kill him without mercy. I woke up from those reflections when the taxi stopped in front of the three-story house where Dapchevich lived. I pressed the speaker and immediately heard his voice. Come upstairs, please. I'm on the second floor. I will wait for you at the door. Quickly I went upstairs. I needed no elevator. I came to Dapchevich's door, but he hadn't come out yet. I rang the bell, put my hand in my pocket and held my loaded revolver ready to shoot. Suddenly the door opened, and amazed I looked at Dapchevich, smiling at me and cordially saying, Hello comrade. My free hand shook his hand unconsciously. Hello Uncle Vlado. I yelled happily, also smiling cordially at him. Earlier during similar encounters, I had been as cold as ice and managed to stay calm. The cordial smile and the warmth in Vlado's eyes, however, completely enchanted me and probably awoke certain human features hidden deeply some way inside my subconscious. His face reminded me of the face of our great national hero Sava Kovacevich. Dapchevich's hair was grey. He was about 60 years old, but looked even older. His countenance showed traces of a difficult life in war and in prison. His eyes shone like bright candles and, even though beholding me for the first time, expressed endless trust. He shook my hand as I were his true-born son, invited me into his house and offered me a drink. We were alone. We started a conversation. I wondered what was happening to me. Shoot, what are you waiting for? The other Zoran, the bloodthirsty UDBA trainee, who yearned for fame, said inside me. The other Zoran told me to stop and talk a little with this noble old man. I made a mistake by listening to this other Zoran. That was my great weakness and mistake, but today I'm proud of it. I felt at once as if I were the accused one and heard the voice of my conscience, Zoran, you are the killer. Your victims are not killers. You are the killer and those who pay you to kill. We talked for almost an hour. Vlado's gaze became even warmer and his smile happier. He told me about his wife and child. I gathered all my strength, looked him right into his eyes and told him who I was and why I had come. Probably my face assumed that horrible expression when preparing to eliminate an innocent victim. But this amiable old man neither yelled nor moved and his gaze told me, OK, go ahead and shoot this old man. I looked down at the floor, my whole body felt weak, becoming soft as a lamb. I began to confess everything to that old man, whom I had never seen in my life and for whom I had been so bloodthirsty. 
He was surprised that the UDBA knew everything about him. I did not reveal the names of my bosses. I was unprepared for this whole situation. I promised to call him again. Suddenly, a strange feeling came over my body and soul. Everything around me appeared in new, beautiful and unknown light. Vlado escorted me down to the street. I took a taxi and soon got back to Marco. At six o'clock, we boarded a train for Holland. Vlado Dapjevic stayed safe and sound behind in Brussels and I wasn't too interested in what was in store for me. I felt a kind of freedom that I had never experienced before and wanted to savor that as long as I could. I was happily singing a song. Marco looked at me in surprise. Because that horribly pale face had vanished. I had broken the chains that I had put on myself. I thought about my wife and son for whom I wanted to live in the future. The train was getting closer and closer to the free country of tulips, Holland, sweet and beautiful freedom. Zorin, the killer, who was sadly mourning in me, had been overcome for good, at least. So I believed at that moment. I couldn't never have dreamt that my long-awaited freedom would be so short and my imprisonment so endless. I threw the guns, which Rados Nedek sent me, away in the water. Burned the passport with the name of Jura Cobrad and fashioned a new one for myself with the name Jan Cerv. I intended to go with it to Sweden to see my wife. But I did not hurry with my trip to Sweden, for I wanted to enjoy my newfound freedom as much as possible. Freedom was smiling at me after so many years of serving the heartless UDBA Secret Service. While enjoying my precious freedom in Holland, UDBA did not remain idle. By the law of their dreadful moral code, there was only one punishment in store for disobedient members. Death at the hand of one of the hitmen. Radolia Marich went to work at once. The punishment had to be meted out immediately and efficiently. He had insufficient time to engage a more professional hitman. One night, I went with Batka and Marco to a cafe called Boomerang where three completely unknown young men approached us. One of them, the leader of the gang, was called Misa. Looking at me with his bloody eyes, he challenged me without any apparent reason to a fight get outside the restaurant. I thought they only wanted to fight. But something told me that they were preparing to shoot me on somebody's order. We walked to the exit. I let all three of them go in front of me. Misa went out first, while the last one to leave was the third member of the gang, whose name was Buka. Misa went to his car, took out a machine gun and pointed it at me. Just before he pulled the trigger, I quickly grabbed Buka and held him in front of me as a cover. At the entrance to the restaurant, I robustly pushed Buka away from me and went back inside. Bullets were flying all over the place. After the shooting had stopped, I cautiously left the restaurant, took a revolver from my car and together with Batko started to pursue our attackers. We searched every cafe, but without success. In one of the cafe, I noticed Rados Nedek with another man. I intended to empty my revolver into his chest but left the restaurant before he even noticed it. I wanted to catch the attackers alive so that they could tell me who had ordered them to shoot me. The next evening, around 8 o'clock, I went with Batka and Marco into a restaurant called Mostar. There we saw Radmila Krivakapik, Sasa's friend. When she noticed us, she turned pale as death. I didn't want to approach her. Batka went to talk to her. I moved to the other side of the hall and started putting some coins in a slot machine. Suddenly, the door opened. Buka stood squarely before me. I quickly grabbed Buka's hand and hit him so hard with my revolver on his head that he fell to the floor. Misa and Joker were standing at the door. When I pointed my gun at them, they started running. I went in pursuit of them. Batka and Marco ran after me. The attackers escaped in their car. I got into Batka's car. He said that Radmila Krivokapik had told me so that his gang had three machine guns with them. This frightened me and we started to pursue them. 
On a square in front of restaurant Boomerang, I noticed a white Volkswagen and recognized Misa in it. Sasa was standing in front of the car, ready to get in. I got out of our car and started shooting like a madman. I saw Sasa getting hit and falling down by the car, but didn't know whether I had hit the other two men. At that moment, Batka drove his car up. I got in and noticed that also Marco was inside. Agitated and furious, I ordered Batka to drive as fast as he could to get us out of there. We heard police sirens all around. A white car stood in front of us on the semaphore. I fired several bullets and then noticed that it was a police car. I told Batka to surrender. While getting out of the car with my hands up, I saw that my mouth and one arm were bleeding. Armed police officers encircled us. One of them bandaged my arm with my scarf. They took me to a hospital, where I was immediately operated on. After that, I was transferred to prison. Instead of that much wanted freedom, which I enjoyed for such a short period, I was put in prison, where I still am today. I was sentenced to 18 years for shooting three men in self-defense and seriously injuring Secret Service agent Sasa, Andrea Grizilch, and his friend Rad Myla Krivokapic. The Yugoslav press called this horrible tragedy staged by the powerful Secret Service UDBA, a bloody encounter among emigrants. Asterisk asterisk asterisk.